All right, welcome everyone. Uh, we are really encouraged to see some names that we haven't uh, encountered here in some of our meetings today. So we welcome you and uh, we just want to hope uh, that you get some value out of this presentation that we're gonna be having today in our uh, another installment of our research webinar series hosted by our team here at the Michigan Virtual Learning Research Institute. Uh, the goal of MVLRI is to expand Michigan's capacities to support new learning models, engage in active research to inform new policies in online and blended learning, and strengthen our state's infrastructures for sharing best practices. MVLRI is a division of MVU, or the Michigan Virtual University, which is a nonprofit organization whose mission is advancing K-12 education through digital learning, research, innovation, policy, and partnerships. MVU also provides student learning services, uh, in, uh, sorry, student learning services for K-12 students through the Michigan Virtual School, as well as professional development opportunities in blended and online learning through its Professional Learning Services Division. Just a quick disclaimer before we get started, this webinar will be recorded and shared publicly. Consequently, anything shared during this webinar, including chat comments, could be shared publicly. This webinar may represent a presenter's or an attendee's personal views, opinions, conclusions, and other information which do not necessarily reflect those of MVU and or the Michigan Virtual Learning Research Institute and are not given nor endorsed by MVU slash MVLRI unless otherwise specified. And now I'll be handing it over to our presenter, Brianne Jackson, who is a virtual instructor and content developer at Virtual Virginia and a doctoral student in the Curriculum, Culture, and Change track of the PhD program in education at VCU. She has been a secondary teacher for 16 years, eight of which she has spent teaching virtually and serves as an instructor for VCU's online teaching certificate program. Her line of research involves preparing teachers to teach online, in particular confronting barriers to successful online teaching. We're really excited to welcome Brienne, and with that, I will hand it over to her. Thank you, Justin, and I'd like to thank everyone so much for um, coming today and letting me take some time um, out of your schedule to share my research and to get any um, feedback you all have about the different things that I'm working on. Um, before I really get started, I apologize if you hear anything in the background. Um, my a few of my rescue animals are a little loud today, so if you hear something, it's probably one of them making a noise. All right, so I've entitled my presentation, um, Let's Get Together and Feel All Right. And um, I hope that's uh, something everybody recognizes from um, Bob Marley. But I've really found that in focusing my research, um, one of the most important aspects in online teaching and learning is the ability to build a community and build a relationship with your students. So that's what my talk is going to focus about today. Um, thanks for the great introduction that Justin did. Um, I, same information is presented here on the slide. Um, I also always like to add that I am a mom myself of middle school students who are actually virtual students as well. So I've had the uh, interesting experience of being the virtual teacher as well as the virtual parent and mentor to my own two children. Um, but really, before I get into my research, I like to explain to people how I came to virtual teaching and why I feel so strongly as I do about preparing teachers adequately for virtual teaching as well as community building. Um, I graduated uh, undergraduate in 2001, and my first teaching job was in Hanover County Public Schools in um, Central Virginia. And within two weeks of beginning my first year of teaching, I was made the technology lead for the Eastern Corridor. And the only reason I was made that was because I was young and there was an expectation that I was a digital native and knew how computers worked. They were very, very wrong. Um, I had to learn very quickly since this wasn't a position I could necessarily turn down. Um, and I did, I went, saw the computer science teacher, spent a lot of time on um, earlier YouTube videos learning how things worked. I never thought that would happen again until uh, eight years later, I was approached by some um, people at Virtual Virginia, where I currently work, and was made the same offer. We would like for you to teach Spanish online. Um, why? You know, why would you ever consider me? Well, because you're good with computers. And I learned very quickly in my first year of virtual teaching, which was the hardest year I've ever had as a teacher, that most of us that teach online don't 
have very much preparation and we are tapped because in theory we are good with computers. So a lot of what I have discovered in my research and in my eight years of teaching online is due to personal experience and firsthand, being someone that really didn't know what they were doing and had to figure it out as they went along. So when we think about what is a community and what do you consider to be a community? Janice and Lee in the Stanford Social Innovative Innovation Review say it's about people. And that is what makes up a community. And I always thought that's a very interesting um, take. I've heard it before, read it again, because it doesn't necessarily say it's a place or a location, but it's about people. And as virtual instructors, we know we don't have a place or a location outside of our learning management system. But what we do have are people. It's founded on the assumption that culture matters. This is an article from Peter Shea in 2006. And we stress community so much in teaching and learning because we understand that there is an element to community, that cultural element that's important to learning. And therefore, the community cannot be forgotten in the virtual realm. Likewise, there is a critical need to create online learning environments and have the capabilities to, to sustain a strong sense of community that supports students both socially and cognitively. So really making sure that we understand in a virtual course, students need both those elements of support, not just the cognitive support with feedback and standard instruction, but the social support just as they would get in the face-to-face -face setting. So as we go through this presentation, think about if any of you are virtual teachers. And are any of you currently teaching virtually now? OK, great. So most of you guys. Oh, wow. OK, perfect. So right, as we, as we go through and talk about this, think about your own experiences. What do you consider a community? And, do the courses you teach reflect those ideas of community? So there's really two theoretical frameworks that drive my K-12 work. Um, I go into a little bit different in higher ed, and we'll talk about that in a second. And the first you all are familiar with is the community of inquiry framework. Um, for those of you that aren't aware of the background, um, it came out of work of Garrison, Anderson, and Archer in uh, around about 1999. The first article is being published in 99, 2000, and 2001. Um, but this work was inspired by Dewey's early work and his idea of building a community of inquiry within a face-to-face -face setting. Um, Dewey was very much into hands-on learning, wanted to make sure that students um, had all these uh, intersection elements that they could be who they were socially and experiment with what they were doing with the content um, and that teachers were there as guiding figures that they were there to set a climate set a stage and then all these things intersected so what garrison anderson and archer proposed was that these three areas could also be looked at in terms of computer-based learning and that the, um, the intersections can be examined very carefully to best provide um, virtual learning, distance learning using a computer setting. Um, there are three different presences here, and I've kind of zoned in on the arrows on two in particular. We aren't going to talk about the cognitive presence, but in, um, cognitive presence is defined as the ability of a learner to construct meaning as a result of both reflection as they're completing their course and dialogue amongst their peers and with their instructor. Social presence um, is always one that I find very fascinating because I see a lot of times, even in the literature, it's skewed a bit. But Garrison, Anderson, and Archer really set out to make social presence be understood as a, the student's ability to be who they are online and not be somebody else. 
So really and truly they feel comfortable with who they are and can share that with others. And that's something I think really gets lost in virtual learning. And then teacher presence is how the teacher is able to take that social presence the students have. The, are they able to share who they are with the class and in discourse? The cognitive presence, which is the meaning making, and fuse those together. The fusion of the three leads to the intersection that you all will see. It should highlight right there. But the setting and climate and then the intersection of all three at the educational experience. So what this is telling us is that social presence, the student who being themselves, is supported by a teacher who creates a climate and a setting that allows the student to be themselves, which in turn, when all three intersect, gets the um, and it results in the educational experience, the students that are actually learning. <clears throat> this is a fantastic framework to understand how presence operates in a computer-based course. However, one of the extensions I have found of it in my own research is that it doesn't necessarily talk much about the teacher social presence outside of managerial. Um, literature that has been based on the teacher presence element of this particular framework really focuses on teachers facilitating discourse, but not necessarily really creating the same kind of climate that we would have in a face-to-face -face setting. The second framework that um, I use in my K-12 research would be the TPAC framework. Um, I didn't ask before, but are you all familiar with these two frameworks for the most part? COI, yes, TPAC, no, cool, yes. Okay, all right, great. Um, TPAC is more, since we do have someone that's not familiar with TPAC, TPAC is more um, in preparation of teachers rather than analyzing the, um, the virtual classroom or the uh, technology integrated classroom as a whole. And it frames knowledge domains that are needed for a teacher to successfully integrate technology into their classroom or have a technology-based classroom, such as virtual learning. Um, I won't spend a lot of time on explaining the different pieces of this because it's a rather complex framework, um, but that information is available at tpac.org. The intersection, however, that I've been interested with is TPK, or Technological Pedagogical um, knowledge. And Mishra and Kohler define that as an understanding of how teaching and learning can change when a particular technology is used in a particular way. And I argue that we can go beyond that and we can say that to really understand virtual learning we need to have an understanding of how teaching and learning relationships can change when a particular technology is used in a particular way. Okay, so how have I put these into practice and the beginnings of my research? I have two areas of research since I'm really concerned with the barriers to online learning in both K-12 as well as higher ed, since we know that the push for K-12 online learning has been a result of the push in higher ed for online learning. In fact, a number of high schools across the country and have a requirement for graduation that students take an online course. That requirement has come down as a result of universities offering more online courses and finding that high school students were not prepared for this type of learning. So it's a really, it's a trickle down approach and I believe that you really need to look at both aspects of it to understand the bigger picture of what makes quality online learning. So in 2016, myself and a colleague, Sarah Warnick at Virtual Virginia, kind of came up with our own framework that looks at the components of a successful virtual community. And in particular, we were looking at our student population, which being that we are world language teachers, our student population ranges in age from sixth graders, who can be as young as 10, to 12th graders, who can be as old as 19. So you have a rather broad age range. And due to the nature of world language, those two age groups can be together. So it makes a uh, virtual community can be a little tricky at times. The four elements that we identified that were necessary components of our successful virtual communities were online persona of the virtual instructor, go back, 
synchronous sessions, meaningful feedback, and encouraging student engagement. And if you remember about the frameworks that we spoke about before, it really is the encouraging student engagement element that has really been focused on in previous research. So a lot of my research currently and going forward is looking at all four of these elements and how they work together. So the first dimension I like to call the, the online persona. And if you think to yourself about what we do when we're in social media and other settings, um, we create avatars of ourselves. Um, very few people are on social media the same way that they are face to face. So we end up creating this image of ourselves, usually the image of we want people to perceive, and that's what we present in the World Wide Web. I argue that in online teaching and learning, we really need to do sort of the same thing. You need to build your online persona of who you are as a teacher, and then as an extension of that, build your virtual classroom. So your initial impressions should invite the student to the learning community. That means that the way you lay it out, and obviously in K-12, some of us know that we have different power, we have different um, abilities to change certain designs of the course, um, sometimes none at all, but making sure that when they first log in that very first time that they feel welcome. So having more than just a start here button, but letting them know immediately you are there and present. Um, I always have for my students a welcome video, and in that welcome video, I go ahead and introduce some of the um, sillier things I do to get them involved, let them know who I am as a person. It's really important, especially in K-12, that online students feel as though they have an actual teacher rather than just someone that grades papers. And that's something that needs to be tackled in the very beginning with online students and with parents, knowing that you're a person. Introductory phone calls, a live session before they really get into work. Otherwise, I find that students, particularly at the middle school level, do not understand the difference between auto-graded assignments and assignments that we as teachers would look at and hand grade ourselves. They both, they believe they're both automatic and that I as the teacher don't see them. And as I mentioned before, teachers should manipulate the learning space as much as you are allowed to mimic, not copy, but mimic what you've done in the face-to-face -face setting. Um, we know that face-to-face -face teaching and online teaching are very different. However, that doesn't mean we can't learn from what we did in face-to-face -face teaching. And thinking about the way you would have set up an in-person classroom, what would you have done to make students feel welcome? Um, this includes resources. Have, have any of you all taught face-to-face? -face? Okay, great. Yes, yeah, so you're dual people like I am. Um, Again, I like to use my personal experience. Um, I've been a Spanish teacher for 16 years, and there are certain things that always hang in a Spanish classroom. Um, the subject pronouns, colors, um, adjectives, the little, you know, the cute little emotion adjectives with the little faces. Those things, posters, you get them at the teacher store, and they are in any Spanish classroom. I like to go ahead and make graphics early on in the year and post those in my courses so that students, when they log in, they don't just see the learning management system with start here. They see something that looks like what it would have been in a face-to-face -face Spanish classroom. And it makes it feel like a Spanish class. A few of the other things um, I do, I, want, I said I wanted to talk more about building the online persona. Um, I want to make sure, especially for the younger students, it's very clear that I'm a person. Um, I always include some sort of bio and give them personal information, again, just like you've done in the past in face-to-face -face settings. That's just enough to be interesting but isn't the uh, oversharing. So um, I love to talk about my rescue animals. The students love to hear about my giant tortoises, the geese, and all the animals I have. And a lot of times in the first couple of weeks, again, since it's Spanish, we're doing descriptions and things like that. Instead of saying someone is tall, fat, thin, etc., I'll put a picture of my animals there. You know, the, the goose is fat. Um, the dog is short and things like that. It really has, it helps the students feel that you're a part of the class as well with them. Likewise, and I've got around the sides, I make sure I tell the students some of my hobbies and I pick it selectively. 
for my uh, K-12 students, I love to tell them about my um, love of science fiction. And I use different cues from science fiction and fantasy shows. Um, these are from Stargate. It's one of my favorites. Star Wars is really popular again, and I really love that. And use those images in news items and in other places around the class as visual cues. Um, in fact, you can see on the right hand side of the screen, we have a horror movie character as well as a character from Stargate that are screaming and look surprised. It's those sorts of things that will get students attention when you need to make an announcement, change something um, or let them know of anything in the course that they need to be alarmed about. Um, likewise, some years I've gone as far as assigning certain characters to certain tasks, so maybe a general in a popular movie means something about the rules need to be examined. Maybe a talkative character is someone, an indication of please call me, it's time to do a check-in call, and things like that. Um, I've had students that have had me for Spanish 1, 2, and 3, and by the time we have our introductory session in Spanish 3, those students were able to go back and tell the new students, oh, well, when you see so-and-so, that means you need to call her to check in. Um, little cues like that, again, build the community, make you feel like a person, and as well give the students a sense of what they need to be doing. Thinking about a theme as well, um, as I said, I, I teach Spanish, so this little thing here with the cat, I don't know if you all can read Spanish, um, but it basically says, uh, sit down, I don't know how to tell you this, but you no longer have a hamster. These uh, memes serve as my posters and students really like them. They like to go and translate the Spanish. Um, they find it to be humorous. Um, I've also incorporated, again, pop culture elements. Um, this was a character that I created, um, Juan Carlos. He's a soccer player and he visits the students throughout their survey course. If you go this route, I do say it's important to find one theme and stick to it because just like in the face-to-face -face class, if you had too much stimulation, it can distract them. So narrow in on a theme, stick to it, and then the students will learn that that's a cue. So once you've established a room, your virtual area, and who you are as a teacher, you will probably be ready to do the synchronous session, which most of us are very familiar with. Um, synchronous sessions really need to be planned like traditional lesson plans. I found that when I came into online teaching and learning, the, um, some of the advice I got was just to wing it, that you know your content. And, oh, right, yes, Bitmoji is so awesome. Oh, no, no, <laughs> no, I mean, that's a, that's a really great one, um, especially I know some teachers that are really, that virtual teachers, that are self-conscious about putting their own picture, but they really want to create the persona, and they have, they've used an avatar program, um, Bitmoji, there's um, a couple others, um, of course, right now they're escaping me, but they've created that avatar, and that's what's populated across their course to kind of create the classroom. But, um, yeah, so as I was saying, the synchronous sessions, I, I've, I was kind of told, oh, you'll be fine. They're not long. They're not 90 minutes like a traditional class. So you can just kind of go in and talk off the top of your head. Well, as you all are virtual teachers, I'm sure you know that that absolutely does not work. On the other hand, a lot of the literature, especially the earlier literature in virtual teaching, has synchronous sessions lumped in with office hours. And you need to understand that those are two completely separate things. Office hours are when you're available for one-on-one -on -one help, just like a professor is at a university. Synchronous sessions are a lesson, and following a traditional lesson plan will make sure that, one, you stay on target, and two, it gives the students something to go back and watch, particularly if you can record these sessions. Um, in fact, synchronous sessions that are organized, and I picked older literature on purpose, um, students report high levels of satisfaction in courses with synchronous sessions. Um, these three references in particular talk about how the synchronous session has been confused with office hours for a number of years. So even when that was happening in the literature, that confusion, um, 
the studies that were looking at schools who were creating lesson plans were noticing a huge difference in student satisfaction. Guidelines must also be set so that students feel valued within the conversation. Making sure that you understand, just like in the face-to-face -face setting, someone can interrupt someone, cut somebody off, um, say something inappropriate in the chat box. Um, I've seen all sorts of things. Those guidelines set up front. Um, the first semester of every year, I have a slide that is up and present when students log into the synchronous session. Um, for lower levels, it's in English. For upper levels, it's in the target language. And those, that slide outlines the guidelines that we will all follow. And it says, by remaining in the session, you agree to you know, take turns, use appropriate language, and it has a whole list of our community rules. And again, like you have learned in regular teacher traditional preparation. Um, yes, I sh should have a couple. Let me, let me pop in my Mendeley and double check. Most of my student satisfaction research has um, been lately in higher ed for this particular thing. But um, have those guidelines up so if they remain in the session, they agree to those things and only list five or so. Keep it a short list. Because um, as we know, the two scroll rule, if it's too long of a list or too many scrolls, they've tuned out of you already. This is just a sample session plan of how we run um, synchronous sessions in the Spanish department at Virtual Virginia. But again, I think it's good to share um, with other subject areas. They have the rule list, but once it's time to start, so let's say the session starts at 2, I will post the guidelines at 145. And at right at 2, 201, I'll change the slides to the warm up activity. So warm up just like you would have had traditionally. Second is making sure that as you go over the warm up and move into the lesson, you have multiple opportunities for student interaction. Um, you don't want to just give the answers to the warm up. Make sure it's something that you can put on your virtual board or have the students talk in the chat. Likewise, the lesson, follow the prepare, present, discuss, prepare them for what is coming, present it to them, and then discuss it. Making sure that you allow multiple opportunities for student input uh, is important as well. Pausing. Um, I do know there's a tendency for some virtual teachers I've worked with and I've trained to want to keep a recording at 20 minutes. So they rush, 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 rush to get through it, don't breathe or stop to ask the students if they're understanding. Um, I even use a simple scale of 1 to 10. I tell them 1 means you're totally lost. And 10 means I don't need to teach it. Uh, Ms. Jackson doesn't need to teach anymore. I can teach her class. They laugh and then can kind of rank where they're going. Um, also, it's important to remember with the synchronous session, the learning doesn't end there. Provide an extension activity, whether it's a follow-up quiz or whether that extension activity is something that they would do the next day, shows up at news, you email to them, or even a discussion board, because those are often incorrectly and underutilized in virtual learning, but it's a great way to extend the conversation beyond the session. And what you see here on the slides, that's one of the uh, sample warm-ups. Reminds them to check their audio, tries to identify the flags. Another one on the side has them identify the members of the family tree. So the third dimension to consider is once you have introduced yourself to your students, you've started to build the community, you're offering the lessons for them, is how you do feedback. And one of the greatest complaints for um, students in online learning is the lack of timely and meaningful feedback. And um, here is one of the, I did, I did put it in there, um, Holmes in 2013 did some work with a community college students in particular but um, spoke with them a lot about feedback and they also echoed that it needs to be timely and it has to point them where they need to go next. Um, one of the biggest mistakes made in feedback in online learning is either saying great job with no indication as to why they did well or 
telling them exactly what they did wrong. Um, I, I have colleagues that in language to this day will go through and correct an entire passage. Um, and we know as teachers that students don't really look at those corrections. So feedback needs to really point in the next steps of learning. You may mark some of the paper, but then go back and if, if possible in your learning management system, include links. Oh, you messed up this particular verb conjugation. Here's the correction for this one. Now look at the next three sentences using and then remind them of where that information was located. Students are more likely to go back, especially if you allow corrections, which is a very valuable way to make sure that they're processing the feedback. But students will go back if you give them an example and then point them to the next steps in their learning. So there is overgrading as well as undergrading. Here's an example of some of the feedback that um, we've provided some students. Um, I always say again, provide it within that critical window. Um, we have a rule of 72 hours of submission, but in today's world, you know, I like to get it back to them as quickly as possible. So if it's going to be a couple of days, just let them know in advance because the typical 612 learner wants instant results. Um, address the students by name. Uh, we actually will write it as a letter in a lot of cases. Um, if you address them by name, it goes back to that persona and that community. They are now a person rather than a graded assignment. Um, always start with the positive aspects, just like you've done in face-to-face -face settings, and then provide a few corrections. As I said, don't go through and correct the entire thing. Part of what they are supposed to be doing when they learn online is learning how to construct meaning, learning how to be independent learners. By giving them all the answers, you're taking that away from them. So provide a couple corrections and then direct them back into the lesson where it was appropriate. Um, we have a little time saver note. Create a template for the most common feedback um, or an audio library if you were doing something um, in any sort of language or anything where you were concerned about pronunciation have those templates to kind of copy and paste. Um, again, I teach Spanish. I have a template for adjective agreement. I have a template for um, incorrect person of the verb, things that students will always make mistakes on because that's how they learn developmentally. Um, the last dimension is the one that usually trips up um, many online teachers, especially new one, and that's encouraging student engagement. The idea of I can't make them do it and I can't make them speak. So they may do the work, log in, but they don't say anything. And again, I've got some of the older research as well as the newer. Simple engagements can have positive impact on student success. That's as simple as in a chat room like this, there's the ability for me to send a private message. So maybe I have the students conjugating verbs on the board and I notice someone that typically struggles has done really well. I can send them a quick private message to let them know I'm noticing. You can do the same with email and a lot of the other communication tools. Um, teachers should participate in discussions. We know that. Um, because it encourages participation and it guides higher level thinking. Um, don't just grade, make sure that you are actually participating and offer counterpoints. Um, you know, instead of just good job, I agree or whatever, ask them to take it a step further, guide their higher level thinking. Because we know, again, some Garrison, Anderson and Archer going back to the community of inquiry framework, active students will actually promote a better teacher presence because when students see their peers actively participating and getting a response from the instructor, it encourages them to participate as well. Online, we always talk in just, you know, general conversation and in the media about how online kind of has freed people. People feel more free to share. They don't do so necessarily because they see see it as something to hide behind or any of those malicious reasons. They do it because they see others doing it. And you can see an example of I can safely share here and here is the outcome. And that's what coincidentally causes that domino effect of sharing. You can duplicate the same in your virtual class. Now, the biggest offender of this 
is the discussion board. It was the bane of my existence my first year of teaching online because I saw absolutely no point in it. And then I figured out, well, I can use this to link students together. So um, in the sample here, I always have my students give an introduction. I actually create a spreadsheet document. Now, I only have 120 students K-12. You may have more wherever you're teaching, but um, we have around 120. So I can break them up by class, just like I did face-to-face. -face, and I can come up with kind of a column where I can record birthdays and other important things. So I glean information from these introductions. And if I want more information or I want to engage the student, I ask a follow-up question. I then take that information and the introductory conversation is the one that lasts the longest during the year because I have the students come back to it multiple times in the content, but I go through my spreadsheet and figure out who has what in common, especially if they're at a different school. Then my second, third, sometimes fourth replies end up pointing students out to each other based on similar likes, dislikes, geographic location. So I have a lot of students that are going to be uh, semi-professional athletes trying to go to the Olympics. If I find out that one of them um, is a gymnast and then there's another one that just does school gymnastics, I will make sure to connect them. And then my response will be like, that's fantastic. I've always been so impressed with gymnastics. Did you know that so-and-so in our class is also a gymnast? Does it work all the time? No. Has it worked before many times? Yes. And in fact, such encouraging of student engagement has resulted in group projects being completed by students that have great geographical distances amongst themselves, instead of students trying to find the other kid taking the virtual class that's in their school. So just some tips on text engagement in the online platform. Um, find not only common ground between the students, but between yourself and the students. So I, I read a lot of young adult fiction because I teach 612. That's been a really good way for me to connect with students. Um, I find most of my students read Rick Riordan, so I always have his latest novel. Um, asking follow-up questions and making sure that your questions do not solicit a yes, no. And if you get a lot of yes, no's, go ahead and change it. Change the question and then have the students revisit the discussion board. Don't just abandon it. Um, relating their postings to that of other students, as I was telling you before. If your LMS allows it, go ahead and link it to that other student's post so then they don't have to hunt and find the person you're talking about. And the last one I just learned from practicing is after you read your students' replies, go back and post another entry, summarizing your students' responses and asking for an extension. I like to set up my discussion boards where if I have a module with 10 lessons, we may have our discussion begin in lesson two. We revisit it in lesson six. And then in lesson 10, we go back to it one more time where I've provided a summary and asked an extension question. By breaking it up, instead of just having the write your discussion board, reply to two others, students actually remember the material and it increases the community and better student connections. So how does this apply for those of us in higher ed? Because I will be honest with you, I don't go into my graduate classes that I teach and put pictures of Stargate characters. So how do we take these same lessons and apply them to the adult learner? I found the easiest way to get adult, adult learners engaged is to step away from the learning management system. Um, particularly, I work with a lot of in-service teachers, and they've become jaded by the learning management system because of the way that their school districts use them um, as kind of a document dispensaries rather than actual learning management systems. Um, in the courses I teach at VCU, we use Rampages, which is an extension of WordPress, and Twitter. Um, and those provide the platforms for the interactions. They're comfortable because people are used to social media, they're used to blogging, and it allows that, um, that extra feeling of community because now I've united them with a community beyond our class. The theory is a little bit different too. Um, the theory of connectivism, are you guys familiar with connectivism? Yay! 
yes, George Stevens, that's right. Oh, good, yay. Um, connectivism is, it's, it's a general theory. It doesn't just apply to adults, but as I've done um, my research and working with the graduate school, it is probably my favorite framework for working with adult learners. Um, connectivism really stems from the idea that we now have this World Wide Web and that you as a learner are constantly learning. And what happens is when you learn something, whether you watch a video on YouTube, whether you take it in a virtual class, whether you read it in a book, you get this information and you internalize it. You begin to make sense of it. And as adults, we automatically relate it to something in our own lives because we've learned at this point how we remember things by making it personal. Then, and this is where connectivism is key, you go out into the World Wide Web and you share what you've learned. This is where blogging comes into play, microblogging such as Twitter. You share that with somebody else who in turn finds the work, internalizes it, and then continues the cycle. And it's this constant cycle where you're actually, as the graphic is shown here from um, Siemens um, seminal article in 2005, it's, it makes this web of connections where you're constantly taking in knowledge, internalizing it, and then sending out your interpretation. And here's what's great about using a connectivist theory in an adult virtual course. So we asked graduate students to blog. And when we had them blog, we did not ask them to blog in APA form. We wanted them to use that traditional reflective practice that you do with practicum teachers when they write the journal, you know, between the co um, cooperative teacher. We wanted their blogs to not be academic. We want you to internalize what you've learned, process it, and then put it back out on the web. We did it too because we wanted them to start utilizing tools that we hoped they would use in their instruction. So it was really a modeling exercise as well. Now, what was really interesting was um, a couple of things came out of this. One was that the public nature of WordPress, and um, we're actually conducting the second part of our research now. We find that blogging in this fashion brought in extended community from outside of our group of students. So we had 10 students in this one particular group that we're examining right now. And they gained blog followers from other fields of education. Um, they gained followers from parents. They got outside feedback from people. And that became really valuable because they could go out and put a reflection. They could post part of their lesson and ask for feedback. And they were getting feedback from not just an instructor and not just the people in the class, but experts in the field and sometimes parents. The personal introductions and the personal nature of the course. So it kind of goes back to what we're talking about, like with online persona in the K-12, making sure that the instructors brought themselves to the course and asked the students to bring themselves to the course, that social presence of COI. That ended up leading to professional recommendations. One of my favorite examples is during the introductions of this particular course, a teacher expressed her love of Dr. Seuss. And a classmate went to a conference found something about how to use Dr. Seuss in biology, tweeted it to her, and then she received a number of tweets from people not even involved in our course that were other ways to incorporate Dr. Seuss into the science class she was teaching. And it was wonderful. And had we stuck to that closed LMS format, and had we stuck to that format of let's only have classmates, let's do the blogging, but let's lock it to the outside world, none of that would have happened. And she actually ended up incorporating some of those lessons with her virtual students. This approach also increased interaction amongst the participants because they started sharing even more. Because as the community grew, as they continued to connect, we had a social presence that was beyond the students just being themselves for a class but they were being themselves in a learning community and began to share with other educators. And here's some examples that um, I, I pulled right out of our data. 
But um, in the top two, we have um, expressing of frustrations. And um, that was really great because the top is in Twitter, the bottom is in the blog. But um, the top one in Twitter where he said he had no Blackboard access from home, um, somebody replied outside of our course again that told him, well, if you use Blackboard course sites, um, you'll be able to, you know, do some things and then copy them over later, which was kind of helpful. Um, that was that was interesting. Uh, at the bottom, we didn't get any outside responses, but this uh, particular teacher who had a problem with the censoring and the filters um, had another student who was familiar with the type of filter her school was using, who was able to direct her to exactly what she needed to tell technical support in order to make sure that this didn't happen again. Um, also, some students just for no requirement, no reason, no grade, just began sharing things that they found out. Um, the student at the bottom found out that very few uh, viewed the orientation video. And that led to a conversation about, well, where do we put orientation videos? Do we make it a requirement? How do we get people to watch those sorts of things? And again, that was a tweet that he just tweeted. There was no requirement that you have to tweet this many times a week, and it resulted in some possible solutions for him. So um, I try not to bore you to death, but talk about what the work I've done in 612 and the work I'm doing right now with um, preparing in-service teachers for virtual teaching. And that's kind of leading into what I'm doing for my dissertation work and how I'd love to get um, thoughts, feedback from you all. But I'm looking into um, how to create virtual community and how to include uh, diverse groups of students. So right now, based on just preliminary research, I find that the best approach so far is to think about how we present ourselves online. How do you present yourself in social media and why? Because that's a nice, that's that condensed version. I mean, we've all heard at this point, social media, what you do on social media stays with you forever. It, it haunts you. So you always think twice, most people do, about what they should post on there. So using that same line of thinking should probably be how you build your persona. And in fact, I've seen some really neat instances of actually using social media as a practice in education because the kids know it. Um, this uh, example is from Schmoop. Um, it's a fun one I like to use with my history students. Um, they've made Facebook accounts for all the Greek gods. Um, um, I actually can provide you, I'll send Justin um, this if you are interested, but there, um, I have a couple of PDFs of how to actually recreate Facebook and have students create their own Facebook pages, their imitation, of course, um, to kind of get the community practice started and um, have fun with uh, mock walls and things like that. I've seen a lot of success with it. This is a study guide that uses the approach. And um, it's one of the things I'm starting to investigate myself because we want to use what they know. And whether they're 10 years old or 25 years old, this is the kind of thing that they're using on a daily basis. So just to leave you with a couple of um, do's and don'ts, things to consider. Um, like I said, do consider what you share with the students carefully. Um, sometimes social media causes us to overshare. So um, choose carefully, think purposefully. Um, if I share this with my students, does it have an educational outcome? And go through things that, on the flip side, things that are important to you personally, and will these things actually, um, what can I use? What do I have in my toolkit at home personally that will help me reach students better? Um, I really encourage, if you're comfortable with it, using a picture of yourself because they know you're a person. But of course, um, you can use an avatar. However, allow your students to use avatars. Um, there is some, some of the work, again, I'm encountering in my dissertation, is kind of playing with the idea that some virtual students are not comfortable putting a picture of themselves nor their parents. So having some sort of way for a student to create an avatar themselves and create it early on can give them an actual person in the class itself and um, help with community building. And 
pose your questions and your assignments based on what they're doing. In virtual learning, we have a tendency to front load. The instructional design is done, the course is created, everything's created, we can have it all released conditionally and on timers. But remember face-to-face -face when we had teachable moments? We can't lose those online. And we tend to, just naturally, to try to be efficient. So take time, even if you mark it in your own teaching schedule, to look for certain things in your courses and then create questions, assignments, based on what the students are giving you back. And then, of course, the don'ts, especially if there are any first-time online teachers watching um, this or the recording, don't be available 24-7. That was my biggest mistake my first year of online teaching. I never stopped working, and um, it really took a toll on my family. Um, don't ever respond first in a discussion board, ever. Always give the students time to respond, and if you see their responses being canned, too short, or they're not responding, give them a gentle nudge, but don't be the first to respond because they'll take the easy way out and just agree with you, even if it's, if it's recopying what you're saying. Um, don't use formal communication for all of your communication. It is important to have netiquette and make sure students understand netiquette, but realize as well that when you're in a face-to-face -face setting, you're not speaking the Queen's English. You are using colloquialisms, you're talking casually, so remember that when you're talking to them, especially if they've come for help, to use that tone as well so that they feel comfortable. Remember, they don't have your face, so they can't read facial cues, and it's still hard to read facial cues over a webcam. Um, also, don't rely on only one method of communication. Make sure that things are going out with chats, with emails, with audio emails. Use the web as your resource to give it to students in many different ways. Um, that keeps it interesting, and it also makes sure that they don't just overlook email because they know that's where your message is going to be. And um, looks like it got cut off in the PowerPoint, but don't forget to be yourself. Um, you create an online persona, but that online persona is an extension of you. So make sure that the person that is teaching those students is an extension of who you are, because um, especially the younger students, they can see right through when it's not. Any questions? I should say also that if anyone would like to use uh, audio, feel free to let me know in the chat window and I can enable audio if you'd like to pose any questions or have some discussions using your headset or whatever audio you have. Um, that's a great question. I've um, I've never been asked, but um, I'm more than happy to make one for you all if you'd uh, give me a day or so to kind of put it together and um, email you. Justin, is there a way to collect everyone's email so I could send that out? Um, sure. I, I We'd probably have to do that here and now, actually, since we didn't have registration required. But if anyone would like to follow up with Brienne, um, I can include my email address, or you can feel free to include your email address, as Kevin has done as well. And we'd be happy to put folks in touch with one another. All right. I'm going to cheat and make a screenshot. Okay, yeah, great. Um, yeah, just give me a little bit to work on that. Um, fortunately, it's a rather light week, so and I'm more than happy to share that with you guys, of course. Yeah, not a problem. Hi, Harold. Yep, we do have uh, all the recordings of our webinars on our YouTube channel. So I'll be sharing the link to that here shortly as well. Well, fantastic. Any 
anything else at all. And just to um, let you all know if you do, let me give you, if you're on Twitter, um, go to the next page too, so I think it has my contact information. There we go. Um, please feel free to shoot me an email, follow me on Twitter, or there is my, um, my personal webpage. Um, I'll be putting out the research um, that we're currently doing on the in-service teachers as soon as possible, um, as well as uh, as fast as I can get it out. Um, the preliminary work on my dissertation on community building and um, diverse student populations and online courses. And if you all have also anything to share with me, since I am a doc student and I am heading this process, please, um, there's my email. Feel free to send anything my way. All right, fantastic. Well, thank you, Brianne, for such an engaging presentation with some really practical application, and I hope our, our audience got uh, some value out of that. Uh, before we wrap up, I, I want to make mention, so Kevin from UC Scout, who is in attendance today, uh, we've been able to work with Kevin and his organization quite a few times over the last couple years. Uh, so he is um, seeking participants for a survey. So if you are an online teacher, uh, you can click the link that he has posted in the chat window there, uh, the UC Davis URL and you can share some insights for a project that they're working on. And I have just a couple items before we wrap up today. Uh, just a few ongoing initiatives that we run here at MVLRI, which folks may find uh, of, of use for them, for, to them. Uh, we do have an ongoing podcast initiative called Virtual Viewpoints uh, that I get the fortune of hosting. And we get to talk to people all around the country who are doing interesting things uh, and using research and doing those things in the area of K-12 online and blended learning. So you can check out our podcast by clicking the link there. And if you're also, um, if if, or I guess if you're copying and pasting that link, it doesn't look like it's a workable URL. But um, if you are interested in being a guest on our podcast, if you'd like to highlight some of the work that you're doing, uh, we'd, we'd love to talk to you. Um, we also have a guest blogger program. So if you are interested in writing for our blogger, our blog program, uh, you can uh, go to our guest blogger program page there and learn more about uh, the, the, the types of work that we're looking to highlight and, and uh, having folks to write for us. Um, so Kevin from UC Scout uh, has also written for us as well. So you can actually see some of the work uh, that they've done over at UC Scout highlighted on our very own blog. Um, just some follow-up information. You can um, keep in touch with us by get, sending us any suggestions or feedback you have about this initiative or any others at mvlri at mivu.org. You can sign up for our mailing list. Uh, you can follow us on Facebook or Twitter. Uh, you can check out our LinkedIn page. Our YouTube channel will be hosting the recording of this webinar. You can find all of our previous webinar recordings at our YouTube channel, uh, youtube.com slash user slash mvlri1. And uh, our webinars page at our website, uh, you can see all of the upcoming webinars that we have through, uh, scheduled through about June at this point, I believe. Our next webinar will actually be uh, April 12th at 2 p.m. Eastern, and we'll be hearing from Verena Roberts at the University of Calgary on a study that she did in which she um, interviewed and surveyed teachers here in Michigan who were implementing blended learning in their classrooms. And we um, had a, a nice research project come out of that uh, talking about what kind of professional learning opportunities uh, might be needed for folks doing blended learning here in our state as well. So with that, we just want to wish everyone uh, a rest of your happy rest of your week and a happy rest of your afternoon. Thank you all for joining us and take care.